you need to read this book. Not only is it beautifully written, it's also an amazing call to tear down our exploitative capitalist system and to build a future for everyone on the planet that is so much better. Hello and welcome to the Green Stocking Society, my name is Shara. In this video I'm going to be pulling out 10 super interesting concepts all to do with the climate crisis and climate change and solutions to that problem from Michaela Loach's new book It's Not That Radical Climate Action to Transform Our World. Hopefully you'll find them really interesting too and you'll see them as a way to really understand the issues plus you'll sound really smart at the next dinner table debate with your weird climate denier uncle. So. You're welcome. Let's dive in. Number one is atmospheric colonialism. This is the idea that countries in the global south, the same countries that are also overexploited for resources and experiencing the worst impacts of climate breakdown, are collectively only responsible for 8% of excess emissions that are driving climate breakdown. So a small number of very high income countries have emitted way more and accelerated the climate crisis so much more than a lot of other countries that have contributed much less but are actually seeing the consequences of that a lot sooner. Of course there is some nuance to this, it's not just global south versus global north. Even in those countries with the highest income and the highest contribution to global emissions, the most privileged and the most elite are the ones that are actually contributing the most to emissions. So we're talking like fossil fuel companies and people with private jets. Polluters like the fossil fuel industry force us into ways of living where it's really really difficult for us as average people in these societies to to live a much more climate friendly lifestyle. We're talking about things like lack of investment in public transport so that everyone has to drive their individual cars for example. Number two is imported emissions. This is the idea that a country's emissions need to be looked at in the context of trade with other countries as well. So for example when we're talking about the UK's carbon emissions we also need to take into account the fact that a lot of the stuff that we consume and that we use here in the UK is made in China and so those emissions will be assigned to China even though they come from things being made for us to consume in the UK. Michaela writes that China is now the manufacturer of the world. This means that the emissions required for all this production is now attributed to China rather than the places where those items are actually used. As imported emissions and consumption emissions are not included in national statistics, countries like the UK can boast of reduced emissions and blame the entire crisis on China. The irony. Number three is redlining. Redlining is the fact that the most toxic and the most heavily polluting industries are located closest to the poorest communities, which all too often means black people or people of colour are the ones that are suffering the worst health consequences. Michaela explains that, similar to the black communities in the UK, black Americans are also much more likely to live near landfills, industrial plants and fossil fuel infrastructure. This process means that fossil fueled power plants, refineries and hazardous waste facilities are disproportionately and deliberately situated in black or ethnic minority neighbourhoods. As a result of this, black Americans are three times more likely to die from an exposure to air pollutants than their white counterparts. Once we know about things like redlining, then we can start to see how climate justice and racial justice are so closely connected and they're not separate at all. Number four is CO2 lonialism, which kind of looks a little bit better written down. This is all about when companies buy carbon offsets to offset their emissions so that they can say that they are net zero or that they are carbon neutral, when actually these offsetting programs are really not very good for the communities where the offsetting is taking place. A lot of these offsetting projects, a really popular one of them being tree planting, is actually pushing indigenous people off their lands, inflicting violence and also damaging biodiversity. Again related to this is the divide between the global north and the global south. Similarly to how it is with atmospheric colonialism, the people that actually own these companies, the offset companies, are located in the global north, whereas the place where the projects are happening and where this violence is being inflicted and this land grabbing is happening are actually in the global global south. So it's actually following the same patterns as traditional historical colonialism. Number five is indigenous and black futurism as compared to white environmentalism. Michaela talks in her book about lots of different types of environmentalism including white environmentalism and alternatives to it as well. White environmentalism is environmentalism that is Euro or Western centric in its vision for climate action. Environmentalism that has tunnel vision on emissions and leaves out ideals of justice. 
against environmentalism that proposes solutions that can actually have unjust consequences, like CO2 colonialism. By contrast, indigenous and black futurism is looking for a future that is more connected to nature, is more life affirming and is more liberating. This means taking a leaf out of the books of these populations who have a very different approach to nature and are actually living in harmony with nature rather than constantly seeking to exploit it, which is what we have under Western capitalism. This doesn't mean leaving white people as a whole out of the conversation, it means leaving behind a system of whiteness which has become really oppressive and instead looking to these other communities and their relationships with nature and the world around them to help us better understand our place in the world and to be able to create a future that is not built on this idea of loads for a very small elite few and nothing for the many. Number six is a social license. A social license is when we all basically collectively agree that something is acceptable or it's fine or it's necessary in our society and greenwashing is a way that companies can secure this social license from us without actually having to make any of these changes. For example we accept and we give a social license to things like fast fashion. Michaela says if enough of us think whether actively or passively that a company isn't that bad is even good or worse necessary then we bestow upon them a social license. It's a pass that means that governments will continue to subsidize these companies, subsidies that amount to a ridiculous 11 million million dollars per minute globally for the fossil fuel industry alone. Number seven is a just transition. The idea of having a just transition comes from the fact that we could have a transition to a better future, one where we save ourselves from the climate crisis, but it could still be based on exploitation and could still fail to consider justice in any real sense. We could have a complete transition to renewable energy for example that is still based on the inherently exploitative and extractivist ideals that we've been following up to this point and that would not be a just transition because it leaves out this element of climate justice for those who have been exploited. A just transition calls for a transition away from harmful fossil fuels to renewable energy that leaves no one behind. A transition that protects jobs and workers, a transition that can lead to enhanced workers rights. Throughout the book Michaela is making this argument that we don't just want a green version of what we have now because in the current system so many people are getting a really bad deal. We want a complete transformation of the entire system. Number eight, elite capture. Elite capture is the idea that the elites who come into power will steer things and resources in the direction of their own interests. I'm talking Elon Musk, I'm talking Jeff Bezos. And an important part about elite capture is the fact that it happens regardless of race or gender. So, you know, we could have a black woman in politics who does not actually do that much for the interests of women, for example, or the interests of the black community because of how they've grown up. So Michaela makes this argument that we don't just want that sort of representation of different genders and different um, ethnicities or different races across politics, but we also actually need a real representation of different points of view and different philosophies and different ways of seeing the world. Because if all of those people have still been raised in private schools and they've all had the same education and the same upbringing, then they're going to think the same way regardless of whether they're black or white or a man or a woman. Number nine is the Overton window. The Overton window is a model for how ideas change within society and how they go on to influence politics. This is what it looks like. It moves from unthinkable to radical to acceptable to sensible to popular to policy and then back again. For example, women being allowed to vote started off being unthinkable but is now policy. Currently, what is normal is things like the fact that billionaires exist and the fact that everything is covered in single use plastic. Like these are things that are just taken to be normal, whereas they should move to becoming unthinkable. And anything that challenges these norms is seen as radical at the moment, hence the title of the book, It's Not That Radical. But we could get to a place where eco-socialist environmentalism is actually the norm and capitalism somehow becomes unthinkable. What's eco-socialism you ask? Well concept number 10 is eco-socialism. If we don't want capitalism then what are the alternatives? 
socialism, Marxism, communism? Whilst less harmful than capitalism, socialism, an alternative to capitalism which centres the economy and people's needs rather than profit, does not necessarily eliminate or prevent environmental destruction. It's very possible for socialist economies to still be based on climate destroying extractivist industries. We must advocate for a combination of eco socialism with degrowth instead, an economy that does not require exploitation of the planet or the many, whilst also meeting the needs of all the people on this earth. So this means moving away from the idea that companies can continue growing forever and ever and ever on a planet with finite resources because they can't. So this means moving towards degrowth, which is scaling down consumption and redistributing that wealth. So no one should have ridiculous excessive wealth that has been built based off the back of people who are being exploited, like billionaires. It doesn't mean that we all need to go back to how we were living in the Stone Age. All right, and that was 10 concepts from It's Not That Radical by Michaela Loach. If you enjoyed this video, then please don't forget to hit the like button and to subscribe and let me know in the comments which one of these you found the most interesting and if there are any other concepts like this and ways of understanding the climate crisis and its solutions that you have recently discovered then do let us know in the comments so that we can all share that knowledge and I will see you in the next one. Stay kind, bye!